Why that organization was significant to Greek Orthodox community? Because it received its legitimacy through ecclesiastic means. Even from the beginning, if he heard there was a Greek somewhere in another country town, his first thing was to go and find them, no matter how far it was. So basically, Greek said to the Australians, we told you so since the 19th century. Pontians is a classic example. They, they, got, they got thrown out of, out of Turkey, ended up migrating in Greece. Then they migrated from Greece, come to Australia, so they've double migrated. The stereotyping was incredible even at that period. Fear is on both sides with migration. They feared us and we feared them. Australia, from thinking monoculturally, moves to multiculturalism. Welcome to Think Greek. I'm Kriakos Gold and we are at the Commons QV here at Melbourne's Greek Quarter. We're going to talk about Greek-Australian migration and we will focus on the period between 1945 and 1967, the big migration wave. What comes to mind when we're talking about that first period and your personal story? Well, the post-Second World War migration program, not in relation to the Greek community here, but generally to migrants who came to Australia, had a, I see it as a quid pro quo thing, especially for the Greek state and Australia. At that time, the then Labor governments of Chifley and Curtin and the first migration minister, Arthur Corwell, um, made a very calculated decision that this country had only about 7 million people. They just lived through the scare of Japan in Darwin. So there were issues of national security and nation building that had to be uh, designed and implemented in order to grow the Australian population. By the same time, Europe, as we all know, was had been devastated by the Second World War. I mean, our first refugees to Australia were the, the ship of 300 uh, Jewish people who fled, who managed to survive the Holocaust. Greece and other European countries, Southern European countries in particular also, um, were unable to provide a future economically for their people. Uh, so within that experience, and my, my parents' generation who felt very betrayed by Greece because they had to make the sacrifice to leave the country, A, for themselves and their futures, but also to help the others who stayed behind to also make a go of their futures. So that was the paradigm in which I was brought up in. And yes, my, my father would have been, uh, like everyone else's, afraid that one day they would be asked to leave the country. So there was never a sense of permanency and total acceptance, but because such a large number of them came out, shipload after shipload after, sh the whole business of numbers also meant that the communities or the, the Greeks that were coming here did have a sense of a stronger collective. They weren't individuals in country towns. They were coming here in great numbers. They were establishing uh, infrastructures that already existed through the formal Greek community, but also they were establishing their own. And through the infrastructures of the church, they started to carve out within this foreign country and within the context of being rejected and not being white. We were the coloured people of the time. That we, today we're talking about other, other coloured people. We were the coloured people of the time. Some of us were a bit more white than others and we had to explain that as well, as I did when I applied for a job at the education department in 1980. In those days, they used to interview you. Um, there'd be three people, two from the department, one principal. And most of my interview was about why I didn't look like a Greek, uh, why I didn't sound like a Greek. And uh, I was being interviewed for a, a job as a teacher, but I had to explain to, a, to three people why I didn't have an accent. I mean, it was pretty obvious why I didn't. I came here when I was four. It was pretty obvious why I wasn't, was a bit fairer because a lot of Greeks are fair, they're not all dark. Uh, I didn't have black curly hair, I didn't, but other members of my family did. So the stereotyping was incredible even at that period. So our generation growing up, um, we had to deal with the conflict of the stereotyping within a context of multiculturalism, which saw Australian, the Australian political world uh, realised that they had a nation full of migrants that they needed to manage the integration of those migrants. They realised that 
the multiculturalism, the cultural and linguistic uh, inheritance of those migrants was valuable to Australia and there and from that period my generation and I've often said it before and I know Dean and, and George and I went to school together our generation uh, our formative years were 1975 the, the the big dismissal the politics of the time it was really hip to be an ethnic we don't use the word ethnic anymore but in those days we were ethnic it was hip and acceptable and that helped me and a lot of others come to terms with who we were as Greeks and what we looked like as Australians. So, you know, it, that period's critical to the development of the contemporary Australian identity. Of course, alongside of that, our Indigenous communities, our Indigenous inheritance and our Indigenous identity had been parked to the side and, and what was active uh, politically was the integration of Australian, Australia's multicultural communities. By the way, yes. thank God you got the job because Tanasi was your student, right? It and was, And yes. how great that you were together at yes. school and then you taught Tanasi. We didn't do this on purpose, by the way. No, no it's just an absolute coincidence. It really is. I'm, I'm sort of an outsider here <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm just listening out aloud. And are, are we after the perfect or imperfect migration? Because the way it happened is the way it's supposed to happen. Are we, are we looking for a perfect or imperfect migration? Because we're foreigners. The word foreign means unfamiliar. So what happened is basically what needs to happen and what will always happen in this situation. So we can think about every single Greek has its own, has their very own reasons as to why they, they came here. And, and no two humans are alike and everyone has their specific reason. So for me, whether this is perfect or imperfect, it's pretty much the way it is for any migrant migrating to any part of the world. The, my generation changed and I'm born in 61. My name's Panay Gudis I My parents enrolled me at Windsor Primary School and I couldn't go as Panay Gudis So at the end of the day, I, kept, I somehow kept Kalakudis and they became Peter. You made Not only me, all of us. All well, I miraculously Greeks. kept my very long Van Bakinu surname that no one could pronounce. But when I was enrolled in 1964 at Brunswick South Primary School, I went from Maria to Mari. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to be Mari, not Maria. Uh, and they didn't tamper with the surname. But I think by that stage, they'd probably given up on the surname. So I became Peter kept... Barracuda. Okay. So it was easy That's to probably pronounce really Calatana, to character Calatana, rather than man. But, but I just want to emphasise the, the difference in my generation difference is the fact is my second son's name is Menelos. And all our friends came to us and said, what are you going to name him at school? Manny, Mento, this, 10 million different names. I said, no, we're going to name him Menelos. You can't name him Menelos. How can you name him Menelos? It's, 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 it's too ethnic. I said, no, it's not. It's not a problem. We live in a multicultural world and we accept that it's, it's a, well, a lot easier for this generation. And what is, what is even uh, um, funnier is the fact is that we stuck, stuck it out, Menelis, and obviously not many Greeks in Australia knew who Menelis was in history or whatever on that one. And he came, uh, was at a school that I had to drop off my son to a birthday party at the time. It was grade four birthday party. And this, in somewhere in Turek, and this gentleman answered the door and I had to pick him up. And I said, who are you? Who are you? I said, I'm uh, Nick, I'm Peter, uh, father of Menelis. Oh, Menelis, the husband of Helen of Troy. <laughs> and it's funny because the, they know the story better than even a lot of us Greeks. You brought up fear before. Your fear is on both sides with migration. They feared us and we feared them. So fear goes hand in hand. It wasn't just fear from our perspective. They feared that we were foreigners, that we were foreign. There was a fear there that who are these people and what are they about to do? I mean, we feared being potentially thrown out, but they feared potentially being overtaken. So I just, I mean, I'm, again, I'm not here for the theory or the philosophical side of it. I'm just I fully appreciate giving you what, my, my perspective. What you're saying, of course, there was fear. On both there sides. was fear on both sides. But it's, it's one thing for me to be fearful of you as your master. Mm -hmm. And it's another thing to be fearful of you as a victim. Okay? And there, there were masters in Australia. That's what I'm trying to say. And they, they, they would treat the newcomers as inferior. 
that was a big, a big kind but of difference. George, can I ask yeah. you on that? Because that's interesting, yeah. that point. Yeah. Fast forwarding now to today, yes. when we talk about the Greek community, yeah. and we do talk largely about the post-Second World War, because that, that was the aggregate, yeah. Yeah. the huge number. Yeah. You, not, you, you won't find very many people who belong to what was the host culture or descendants of the host culture not agreeing that the Greek community and other communities, migration generally, but the Greeks specifically are often singled as having made tremendous successes yes, yes. everywhere, right? I mean, you know, into parliament, in the arts, in education, yes, in a, yes. everywhere. Um, so that generation that may have felt that it was, it, it had to submit to a host culture actually has got uh, a lot of ownership, has now got incredible yes. ownership of this yes. country's economic future as well, its present and also its identity. And, and it's operating at that level now. Yeah. So that's interesting in itself. So why is that, I George? See it a little bit, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree, Marie, yes. But uh, yeah, I, I also have a kind of different kind of interpretation of certain events. Let me begin again by fear. The fear of, of white Australia was that certain groups can contaminate the purity of the white race, simple as that. So they thought of us that if we are left alone, we can contaminate the, the, the whiteness of the white race. For example, the trade union movement. You know, they thought that Italian and Greeks can undermine the trade union movement, you see, for a number of different reasons. But if we go back to, to Mary's, Mar, uh, Maria's point. You see, with mass migration, we have, again, I'm, 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 I'm presenting a picture of how Greeks, through their institutions, created public images for themselves, okay? So individual Greeks, like ourselves, have their own stories, okay? Um, hugely interesting stories, but at the same time, implicitly or explicitly, we create public images for ourselves because we are asked to by what we can call dominant society. With mass migration, Australia accepted uh, uh, Northern Europeans for a number of reasons that uh, Mar Maria emphasized very nicely. But when we come here, okay, we, we go to factories. This is a massive shift for the Greek communities. Why? Because the Greek communities, pre-50 Greek communities, were the communities of the shop owners. Simple as that. They had full control. They had full control of work, first of all, you see. They had the money. There was an alliance between the Greek shop owners, institutions like, like the Greek community, the church and the consul and the newspapers. Sim simple as that. They were discipline mechanisms, okay? And there are tragic stories, suicides and tragic stories for, of people who resisted and reacted. When, with mass migration, the communities, from the communities of the shop owner, they become the communities of the worker, you see? Within this new frame, migrants, Greeks, but other migrants, of course, started developing a new kind of political discourse, and they started behaving not as perpetual foreigners, but as responsible citizens. So they tried to draw from the Greek tradition, which is a tradition of suffering, tradition with genocides, tradition with resistance, elements that can help them develop as citizens and challenge the white story, okay? So this kind of challenge lasts until the 1980s, basically. Australia, from thinking monoculturally, moves to multiculturalism. But multiculturalism, as Maria emphasized, became an instrument of management. How do we manage difference? Once we exclude difference, now we, we try to integrate difference, mm -hmm. you see? So they incorporate difference, they de depoliticize difference, and they create the communities of the success story, you see? But at the same time, they, they create communities of the, the white, but not white enough, the Vietnamese or the Muslims, you see? So we Greeks move from the not of not enough to the end white and white enough the successful communities. And when we move to post-multiculturalism, because this is the era, in my opinion, of post-multiculturalism, not of multiculturalism, when we move through Howard to post-multiculturalism, the monoculturalism of white Australia reappears 
as, of course, one voice amongst many, but the voice that can keep Australia together. Because as Held emphasized, difference cannot create unity. We need a uniting force, and the uniting force is the Anglo-Saxon tradition. In the post-multicultural period, Greekness or ethnicity becomes lifestyle. It's depoliticized and it becomes ritualistically a lifestyle. I choose to be Greek, that's interesting. Let's cross to Costas Marco to see what was happening at the Greek community at that time. Then we're post-World War II, we, we have uh, immigration commencing with the agreement that was signed in 1952 in Spain between Greece and Australia. Uh, we have mass, uh, mass migration commencing mainly the first two or three years, so 1953, 54, 55, all males, and from 1956 onwards, the policy change where they started accepting females uh, as immigrants and mainly females that uh, were either engaged or were prospective brides. This changes the whole dynamics of the Greek community. All of a sudden you have a huge influx of women in the, uh, in the, from the commencing of the 1950s and you have the birth of a contemporary Greek community. Uh, these women essentially were women from rural Greece, uh, agriculturally like inclined, very few so like a working class living, uh, working class people that arrived to Australia. Uh, they were immediately so like dragged off to get married sometimes, uh, immediately commenced families, and at the same time were working in factories. Very few of them stayed home. Uh, and at the same time, the majority of them were in relationships that they didn't even know the person. It's like, oh, this, this exchange of, uh, of photos existed, and they accepted their place in the majority of the cases. Uh, there are elements that, that uh, contemporary research has not examined with regards to women coming to Australia, uh, which I don't know for what reason, I think that there is a certain stigma attached, and I think eventually something will happen, and, some, and, certain, and certain research will come out with some certain documentation that are really important and significant that we, we should be able to articulate. But there was a concise uh, flow of immigration from regional Greece rather than from the large centres. The journey never ends. Stay with us for more in Greek next week. What we do here is not good enough to be considered Greek Australian culture and it doesn't stand on its own. When working class women write memoir, it's deemed a bit trivial. The losers of the Civil War. And that were the communists. Those were the communists. Mm -hmm.